even though it may also apply to other fields. So the first part is, um, now let me see if I can have this a little smaller, yeah, is on the empirical evidence of uh, stochasticity and uh, the concept in general. No. So what do we mean with stochastic variability? So there are different words. Um, we can use, or say, also stochastic noise or just noise, hydrodynamic noise, and in particular, unprovoked variability. It's not the direct response of some forcing. And to first demonstrate that this is really something, I'm starting with an experience we had um, uh, in 2019. So we were underway with our glorious research um, vessel, which is not very big, you know, and uh, we had collected uh, letters in bottles from children, and uh, we had promised to set them into the sea, and uh, then the chances are that somebody would find them and report back. And so you see here the blue star, that's where we uh, threw all the bottles out at the same time within one or two minutes, and the ship moved only very little, and that was in 15th of July 2019. And then the red dots indicate where bottles were found. And you see it's all over the place. Uh, not on the southern coast, though, but otherwise in the west and in the east. And if you just go for the mean circulation of the Baltic Sea, indicated in this sketch, then you see, well, maybe uh, the preferred direction of the flow of course, there's also the atmospheric part, is uh, westward, if not uh, eastward to Irland. Uh, but uh, this is where we, where quite a few bottles were found. And if we look closer to the Baltic Sea, and this is a satellite image, uh, which shows just a small block uh, north of Gotland. Uh, and uh, you see the southern tip of Gotland uh, right to, at the number 19 there. Then you see uh, the Baltic Sea doesn't look like this nice sketch, which is of course valid for the long-term mean, but this instantaneous uh, satellite image shows that it's full of small things, uh, which behave in a relatively irregular way. So the Baltic Sea is full of eddies and other small scale features. And I would say this is a nice demonstration that we have unprovoked variability in particular on small scales. These eddies are not a response to, to a certain specific atmospheric configuration or whatever. And here we call this noise. So please accept that I use the word in this sense. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what, where does the stochasticity come from? And my claim is the noise is internally generated by a very large number of nonlinear processes. And we use the mathematical construct of stochasticity. This mathematical construct allows for an efficient description of the simulated and observed climate variability. It does not matter if God is rolling a dice, as long as we cannot discriminate if he does so or not. It is a good way to describe things. And here we have the so-called my process, and you see the equation, and uh, the state tomorrow is R times one minus uh, uh, today. And um, we have in the top diagram, we have two realizations where we had different Rs. <coughs> and you see that uh, these, uh, it behaves quite irregularly. And if we add 10 of these, then uh, we get one of the two curves in the middle diagram where we also have a time series of uh, random uh, Gaussian random numbers. And so obviously they, their character is quite similar. And indeed, if we calculate uh, the distribution function of uh, uh, these, this average of 10, then we get something which looks like a Gaussian distribution. And this is the first exercise which I have suggested, namely that the students play a, a little bit with these my processes so that you try to generate different realizations, you average across 
uh, these uh, different uh, time series which you have generated, and you then determine the frequency distribution, possibly derive the autocorrelation, and fit a Gaussian process and see if it's a good fit. Now, that is something uh, which would be done after the lectures and only for those who like to do it. And this is taken, by the way, from a textbook which uh, Stefan Güss, Martin Heim, and myself published in 1999 in German. German is uh, a language spoken mostly in Germany. It's a kind of lower Dutch. And uh, so uh, if you want to see more about it, then you find it there. Now, the term, term noise has many different meanings in various disciplines. And see here, I stress that again. Noise is, the term noise refers to internally generated variability, which cannot be traced to specific external drivers, and they would call it smoke without fire. It is conceptualized as stochastic variability, possibly conditioned by some state variables. And my claim is noise is an ubiquitous constitutive element in the dynamics of climate. And I will now have a few cases of unprovoked variability in simulations with crazy realistic dynamical models. Crazy realistic dynamical models means these models feature as many feature, uh, as many processes as you can afford on your computer. So this is a, a time series from Iran Zurita, uh, who ran um, a coupled atmosphere general circulation model for a thousand years which is subject only to periodic uh, annual forcing of solar radiation, but has otherwise no variable forcing. So there's no CO2 increase, no volcanoes, no solar variability. And the model simulates a full range of thermodynamic variables such as air temperature and so forth. And um, we have no forcing on time scales longer than one year, the annual cycle, uh, but we see that the model is generally significant persistent anomalies. And if you look at the top right diagram, then you see the annual mean temperature for Europe. And then you see that we have anomalies extending for uh, sometimes 50 years or so, um, uh, even though I had cut off the, the, the year numbers uh, with an amplitude of half a degree or so. And um, you see also that there's a broad, a broad range of, um, uh, of um, annual temperatures and the spectrum also shows that we have uh, a red spectrum. Another case is done from work which I did with Beate Geyer and Thomas Ludwig. Uh, here, this is a regional uh, climate model, and uh, that means it is forced um, not only by the climatic forcing factors, but also by the lateral boundary conditions. And so we have two ensembles of extended simulations with the same atmospheric regional atmospheric model. And one ensemble of five members uh, is generated by using different initialization times. So uh, one was initialized on the 1st of October of a certain year, and the next one uh, six months earlier and so forth. Then we have another ensemble of five members which uh, with an identical setup, but they are run on different computers. So they have the same initial time. And uh, then uh, what we see on the right-hand side is that the simulations show episodes of what I call intermittent diversions in phase space. That means at the same time in all members of both ensembles. And so you see um, on top uh, the curve at a point in uh, somewhere, I think Oslo or something of that sort, and uh, for one year only, and it ran for 20 years or so. And you see that uh, they these curves begin to, these are the deviations from the ensemble mean. And you see that uh, we have in the later part of the year, we have excursions in both platforms, in, in both uh, ensembles. And if we compare the standard deviations between these two curves, that's a lower diagram, then you see they're really very similar. That means this behavior is not the property of the experimental setup, but the property of the dynamics of the system. And these are unprovoked. There's no reason, specific reason why we tell so. But we found out that these episodes coincide with boundary conditions, which impose a weak through flow. That means dynamical conditions allowing for the minuscule noise to manifest in large scales. 
The third one is uh, from, uh, from an ocean simulation uh, done by Tan uh, and others. And uh, here we have uh, multi decal simulations with an ocean model, and we first have an almost global model that is the entire map there with one degree greater resolution. The West Pacific, that's a larger red box with 0.2 degrees greater resolution, and the South China Sea model with 0.04 degrees, that's a smaller one. And the first model hardly describes macro turbulent eddy dynamics, but the other two become better and better in doing so. Here we have no atmospheric weather forcing. Uh, we only have long-term monthly means, and these are strictly and, uh, periodic. And if we then look at the intensity of the day-to-day -day variations, uh, then we get uh, these four maps. These are actually the logarithm of the mean intra-seasonal variance of sea surface height in the South China Sea. In summer, and we see with the course model, there is some activity going on. And if we go to the higher resolution model, the South China Sea model, then we have a substantial number. So these are all examples of this, that this happens. Now, a little bit on the history of DS, what was known at the dawn of modern climate research. And I would say that was in, in about in the 1970s. And here I have a diagram from Mitchell from 1976 showing uh, for a, a broad range of time scales, what people thought, uh, how the variability looks. And we have, of course, the one day and one year as, as peaks. We also the 12 hours and the semi-annual. But we have variance everywhere. So it is not so that uh, we have only, that we have a sum of spikes, but we have a continuum. And to study this and others, Reimer Lust, the president of the Max Planck Society, then in the 1970s asked Klaus Hassemann to build a Max Planck Institute to study climate change. And this resulted uh, this year in a Nobel Prize in 2021. So you see Klaus Hassemann on the left hand side showing his, uh, whatever is that, document. And uh, then we have here the abstracts of two papers which were essential. Uh, for this uh, one was published in 1976 on the stochastic climate model and the other one in 1979 on the signal to noise problem in atmospheric response studies. Uh, I'm not showing this to advise you to read these articles because Klaus Hansen's papers are usually in the beginning quite complicated, even though for himself very simple. But for uh, uh, mortal people like us, uh, it may be a challenge. And uh, we have prepared a book on, his, on uh, Klaus and his achievements and how co-workers got along with him. And this book, and here I have the cover, will be published open access later this year by the Springer Verlag, so in case you're interested. Now, the first thing is I want to speak about is Hasselmann's uh, concept of the stochastic climate model. And this has become very simple. In the beginning, it was considered very complicated, hard to understand, but now, and this is always so with great ideas, that it becomes extremely simple. So if we look at a dynamical system given by a differential equation, uh, x prime is a function of x itself, of course, and the forcing in the dynamics d. And if we think uh, x is made up of a, a system which with long-term fluctuations and uh, short-term fluctuations, x is equal to y plus z, if we linearize the whole thing, well, then we arrive for an equation for y prime, namely d times y plus w. And uh, to have this stationary, it is required that d is less than uh, one, uh, zero. And the effect uh, w of the short term variable z or the long term variable is considered to be stationary and to have no not noteworthy autocorrelation at short term time scale. And then we arrive at this equation yt plus one is equal alpha yt plus wt. And this is an autogressive uh, process of first order. And the spectrum, the time spectrum is red and that is shown uh, uh, on the right hand side, you see two different spectra. And you see for short frequency, long time scales, we have much larger variability than for short term ones. I mean, that's essentially it. That means these models of the dynamics and of the components of, of the climate system and of its components generate variability on all time scales without being provoked for doing so. It does it internally 
and I used to say, we have smoke without fire. And this explains, for instance, something we will add to this. This shows the 300 hectopascal geopotential height field in the northern hemisphere. Uh, on the right hand side, the mean 1967 to 81 January field. And uh, well, well, we have the circumpolar, we have the uh, flow around at mid latitudes. Uh, but then we have two individual years, 81 and 71, they look rather different. And of course, one could ask, why is that so? And the uh, likely answer is because there's stochasticity in the system. Another case is, and that's maybe more appropriate for you geologists here, um, that um, uh, shows the oxygen isotope time series from GIF2. Uh, on the top, uh, it is not entirely stationary if you look at that, so the uh, behavior changes. But if you, they calculate, if one calculates the spectrum, and now it's, it's um, yeah, uh, it's a linear scale, then you see uh, the, the the wobbly line is uh, the, uh, the estimate, and the solid black one is the estimated red noise spectrum. So indeed, it seems that this applies very well. Now, before the introduction of the stochastic climate model concept, and uh, again, more so, uh, more and more so in recent times, people were convinced that all remarkable developments in climate must be related to one or more external reasons. And now Hasselman demonstrated there smoke without fire and climate variability. That means low frequency variability is generated as the integrated response to short term fluctuations, as for instance, market travel and atmospheric flow at mid latitudes. Thus, a new task in climate science analysis emerged, namely the identification of a small space within which the dynamics of the considered signal rules, while the remainder acts in the spirit of the climate, stochastic climate model as a stochastic forcing. This is uh, what Klaus Hasselmann named the pips and pops concept. Thus, changes are a result of both external and internal stochastic forcing, internal forcing and internal stochastic forcing. And the question arises if an anomaly, this deviation from the, from the normal, is just internally generated low frequency variability or caused in part by specific external causes. And that concept is called uh, Klaus Hasselman detection and attribution. This is, uh, so this paper on the pips and pops, and uh, it's also not easy to read, but I think for me, this paper is the paradigm shifting achievement which got Klaus the Nobel Prize. Now let's uh, just speak about it conceptually. So if this is our full system with a number of processes, uh, maybe more important than others, some are very important, others not, and we have a number of external influences acting upon the system. If we want to deal with this system, then we need to find out what is the key dynamics. What are the processes which really matter? And uh, so I sketched this here. And so this may be these here. And uh, uh, then we are only looking at this so-called signal space, the small part, while the rest is considered noise or stochastic variability. And of course, the choice is problem dependent and may be guided by best predictability. And only part of spatial temporal scales are selected and also the parameter ranges limited. And then the PIP model in the end is this. So we have one external influence, or maybe two. Uh, we have only these the processes which we have identified as relevant, and the external part is closed by conditional stochastic models. So far, good practical examples of the full PIP concept, exploiting the full complexity of the ansatz, are not available. However, as a conceptual ansatz, it has been most successful, at least it's steering my thinking to a large extent. And for the special case of linear dynamics, the PIP concept leads to POPs, principal oscillation patterns, and they have been implemented successfully for a number of cases, such as the tropical Madden and Julian oscillation in the atmosphere. And I will talk about that a little, and I hope I still have the time to do so. So to explain this part here, we speak first about what people in atmospheric sciences call normal modes. 
So let X be a stochastic vector process and the evolution of X is assumed to be well approximated by a linear process. That is dx by dt is a matrix A X plus R uh, with a constant matrix R driven by noise R. And we assume that the noise forcing a zero mean and then uh, we derive, uh, discretize the whole thing and then we arrive at our equation xt plus one is equal to b, that's the matrix xt plus the noise. And the matrix depends on the details of the time discretization. Now, b has uh, uh, eigenvectors uh, um, and eigenvalues and uh, has a complete set of linearly independent eigenmodes with eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And uh, normally uh, B is not symmetric so that uh, some or all eigenvalues are complex, but X and B are real, therefore they occur in con complex conjugate pairs. And then we can write a solution in the form of X is equal then an expansion into these eigenvectors and has certain coefficients AK of T times PK. And then because they're eigenvalues, vectors, we get instead of the one equation one, we get uh, n equations, uh, independent equations of the coefficients, namely that the coefficient of a k, uh, of the kth um, uh, eigen uh, co expansion coefficient is equal to lambda, the, uh, the eigenvalue, times uh, uh, the expansion coefficient at time t plus the forcing term. And so the solution is given by five. So it is, uh, it is, um, uh, it has a complex component and a real component. So it's a described damped oscillation. Now, you know, if we do not have this stem matrix B, then we can estimate that from the data. And so we form then uh, the lag one covariance matrix that is uh, the covariance between all components of X and C1 is the lag one covariance matrix, which compares uh, the state at time T plus one and time T, and then B is C1 times C0 to the minus one. And uh, the other details do not matter here. And uh, then uh, the interesting thing is from this equation I've shown you before, uh, if we have conjugate complex pairs with real parts and imaginary parts, they tend to build sequences, namely, first we see a minus P1, then we see after a quarter of a period given by the eigenvalue, a P2, then a P1, then a minus P2, then a minus P1, and these are the plots. And we did that for the Medlin Julian oscillation in the tropical atmosphere, which is a wave one pattern traveling eastward around, uh, across the globe within 30 or 60 days. And um, we use as uh, we look at the variable uh, equatorial velocity potential at 200 hectopascal, subtract the annual cycle and filter with the first US and to the 30 to 90 day band. And we identified one useful pattern. This is this velocity potential along the equator. And I told you before the pattern is minus P1 to P2, P2, P1. And so P2 to P1, you see here, is traveling eastward. It's a wave num feature, uh, one feature which is traveling eastward as we expected. And the time scale is something of the order of 40 to 45 days. And if we look at the time series uh, on the top left, then you see that they indeed are very coherently, but stochastically. Uh, so the dashed curve leads the solid curve. In the, block, in the lower one, you see the manifestation in terms of the velocity potential not only along the equator but in the entire tropical region plus the outgoing long wave radiation which is a representative for rainfall and cloudiness in the middle there's the equator and you see that we see uh, there are also big precipitation anomalies traveling then we can ask is it possible to make any predictions of that sort in the top right you see a prediction of the phase and amplitude of uh, uh, this pattern and uh, uh, the small regular triangles is the forecast and the line is what actually happened and it's uh, not that bad it, of course it could be better but it's indeed predicting that we have this behavior and if we then look at uh, uh, how good are these forecasts given the intensity of the initial state then we see that if we're very strong initial uh, situation with an mgo then we have quite a good predictability 
for something like 20 days or so, much better than uh, what we compare it usually with persistence. But this somehow ends the lecture, but let us return to the Baltic Sea for a final diagram. Namely, this is done by Ulrich Kallis, who um, simulated this effect of dropping our bottles uh, southeast of Bornholm and uh, I can't show it. Yeah, this is the red dot. It, uh, he used a transport model uh, to, when the bottle was transported by actual wind conditions and, or at least analyzed wind conditions and analyzed uh, uh, analyzed uh, currents and add component to the system. And here we have two trajectories for 90 days. And you see in one trajectory, the, the, the bottle first uh, goes southward uh, and uh, eventually back to the north and ending up in uh, Skåne uh, in southern Denmark, actually almost close to our summer cottage, which is on the far left side of the map. And the other one is avoiding our summer cottage. So it's first moving a little to Rügen, and then eventually ends up somewhere in Latvia, or maybe this is still Lithuania. So this is nicely reproduced, this behavior. And this ends my lecture for now. And uh, I hope I was not too fast, very likely I was. Uh, in the end, you can have the transparencies to look at that if you want to see it again. That's it for now. I'm impressed that my um, internet line is still working fine. Could anybody, somebody say if you can hear me well? We can hear you well. Thank you, sure. Now part two is um, noise is a constitutive element, namely generating structure on the one hand and the other role is masking signals. And so the first part is noise as a constitutive element. Uh, and, uh, the bottom line is noise causes low frequency variations and smoothing of tipping points in the climate system. And I have two examples. Uh, one is with an energy balance model, and that's also the subject of the second exercise I have thought of. Maybe if we think about what is the uh, atmospheric temperature, given that we have, and look at the sketch, please, uh, incoming shortwave radiation E with an energy E and outgoing. Uh, long wave radiation uh, with an intensity of alpha A. So uh, it describes, uh, so the solar energy arrives and part of it is reflected back into space and, uh, but beta times E arrives at the surface and leads to warming. And uh, given the temperature, uh, the uh, radiation is uh, 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 power four, uh, proportional to the power four of temperature. And then A is emitted away from the atmosphere, but part of it is caught by uh, greenhouse gases and is reflected back to the atmosphere. And only alpha A goes out. And uh, in the end, the system arrives at a stable point when the amount of energy, uh, which is beta E plus alpha A, is equal to E. And uh, if you do a bit, little bit of number crunching, then you arrive that uh, with the present atmosphere and a beta of 0.3 and alpha 0.64, um, you arrive at a temperature of 15 degrees C. Of course, that is also made so that it just fits. While if we had no atmosphere, we would have a minus 4 C. Now, uh, if we modify this a little, namely that we say, oh, this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, the albedo, that is the beta, Oops, where am I here? <coughs> we make this temperature dependent. So if it is uh, very cold, then we have more, we have uh, more ice uh, surfaces and uh, the reflection is more efficient. And we have a stronger albedo I mean, backscatter. And if it's warm, we have less so. And then you arrive at this curve, the solid black curve. And uh, then uh, if you integrate our model forward in time, then you arrive at one of the two 
points uh, after 100 years, uh, 285.5 or 288.5 or 287.5, depending on where you start. And so you, you have this, uh, in a sense, you have tipping points here. And um, but um, if we uh, randomize the transmissivity, that is the alpha, then we get a very different behavior, namely the curve shown below. This is in a thousand years. And you see that we still see a preference for the two states, but the system flip flops between these two, and there are variations around it. And if we go to the uh, distribution, uh, frequency distribution of that, then we see we have got a bimodal distribution by making the system stochastic. And so this is the second exercise I suggest you do, namely that you uh, integrate this energy balance model uh, and uh, with uh, um, uh, the first, the alpha uh, randomized and uh, none. And that should be a beta. I'm sure this is there's something wrong. But that's part of the exercise that you find out if you uh, swap alpha and beta. You enter then the time, the, uh, the temperature dependent on alpha beta. Another example I have here, it's also uh, older than most of the students, I would presume. That is a study which was published in 1990, 1990 by my and Mikola uh, this was an ocean model, a conventional ocean model, which was forced by the atmosphere and stationary forcing. So the wind is, uh, I guess, there's a constant uh, annual cycle on that wind, heat, and freshwater fluxes. But there's also random zero mean precipitation. So we have white noise. And so the, the, the disturbances we have in precipitation at each time step and at each grid point is uh, independent of each other. And uh, then uh, you see that uh, the uh, time series in top right, uh, which is showing for 3000 and whatever years, the evolution. And in the beginning, the first 100 years, nothing happens. So then it just begins to grumble. And then it starts to show marked characteristic, yeah, you could say oscillations. And then there's a break again after 1,700 years and another one at 1,700 years, but it shows this behavior of a stochastic variation. And if you calculate uh, the um, spectra, time spectra of these two, then we have for the forcing the dashed curve, which is white. I mean, it's more or less the same level throughout, but the response, what the ocean does do it, is a response without any further forcing only this time variable forcing, only this um, uh, white noise forcing shows um, uh, um, little variability at uh, short periods and a lot on large variabilities. And indeed we see a peak. It's something like 400 or whatever years. This is something like an eigen oscillation of the system, which is exciting. So in this case, it would be more like an autoaggressive process of second order. So you see the noise is doing something, it's creating something interesting. On the other hand, noise, it conceals something. It hampers the identification of force changes in the models and in the climate system. And uh, I briefly touched upon that when one of the students was asking before. So there's one numerical experiment with dynamical models. It's the influence of the shape of the ocean's surface waves on atmospheric state. And then the identification of the effect of anthropogenic influences on regional climate, uh, the buzzwords are detection and attributions. I chose this spectrum from 1976 before. And uh, so variations, I'm just summing up what I had said before, are ubiquitous in the climate components, in particular in the atmosphere and in the oceanic dynamics. Some variations may be externally forced, in particular in the annual cycle but many are not. They are unprovoked by external factors and represent the kind of smoke without fire, and the letters sometimes called noise. And uh, noise is considerably for atmospheric and oceanic dynamics, but hinders the identification of causes, influences. And if you want to read more about it, you can go to the original paper by Klaus Hasselmann, which is difficult to read, or the wonderfully clear paper by myself and two others, 
uh, which was published uh, in 2001 uh, in mathematics and limited. Uh, the mathematical concept of stochastic process has turned out to be powerfully describing noisy variations. Now, one element we should be aware of when dealing with this is the concept of a statistical test of the null hypothesis. It is a suitable tool for discriminating a signal, which is a shorthand for a change due to external causes, from noise, shorthand for variability internal to the system. The suitable tool in our statistical tests of hypotheses, and it was introduced, um, at least that's what I'm aware of, by a paper in 1974 by uh, Bob Chervin yeah, and uh, Larry Gates and Stephen Schneider for atmospheric applications. So the null hypothesis is, that's the one which is tested, that an observed change delta is related only to internal variability. Then the alternative hypothesis is that at least part of the observed change is caused by external factors. Observed could mean in real, in, in real world data or in numerical experiments with models. To discriminate these two options, we build a random variable here named S, which describes the outcome of the sampling process if the null hypothesis is valid. So we somehow learn something about the system and form certain characteristic numbers such as mean values or so. And uh, so we need to know what is the distribution of this S if the null hypothesis is right, if there is no external cause. Then we can also get the, uh, the, the distribution of S. And if the observed change is larger than SP, as P is the pth quantile with its subjectively chosen P, often 95% or so. Of course, given under the assumption of the null hypothesis being valid, if delta is larger than SP, then the occurrence of delta in a regime given by the null hypothesis is sufficiently rare. So that we conclude that the null hypothesis is false and we accept the alternative hypothesis as valid. Now, statistical tests are asymmetric. The outcome is either the rejection of the null hypothesis or the non-rejection of the null hypothesis. The former, the rejection, is taken as evidence for accepting the alter alternative as true. The latter, represents nothing more than insufficient evidence for the alternative, which is not to be taken as alternative is false. If we cannot reject an hypothesis, we know nothing. So when you're dealing with a statistical test, you have to say, what is the null hypothesis? You have to make sure that you have considered the sampling properties adequately. For instance, if uh, it is built from data, which are correlated or not, then you have to do this. It's, it's really very simple in the end, but for many, this seems to be a real difficult concept. Now, this is uh, the study I mentioned before, Ralph Weisse from 2000. And it's just an example. Does the shape of ocean wave spectra affect atmospheric weather phenomena? And, it was a model which used ECAVON, which is no longer known in these days. And we have two ensembles of simulations. One is the sea surface roughness is obtained from the standard Charnock formula, so it depends only on the wind speed. And then we have an alternative formulation named the impact of wave is explicitly accounted for in the sea roughness, surface roughness, using wind over waves coupling theory. And so this is the region we are looking at. Here you see Greenland and, the, uh, and uh, Iceland and the British Isles. And here is the local sea level pressure difference in hectopascal between the ensemble means of the two uh, simulations. And these are the lines. And uh, we have uh, differences up to four hectopascals here. And uh, naively you would say, okay, yeah, we see a, a significant change of 
the air pressure south of Greenland with up to, uh, with, uh, up to four hectopascal difference, and also some minor ones. But if we do then our testing, then we see that the only areas where we have a significant change or where we reject the null hypothesis of only internal variability in the area with the gray, which is gray marked. That is, the big change turns out to be insufficient evidence for claiming that uh, we cannot do it only with internal variability. On the other hand, we see large areas where we see, yes, uh, we cannot explain it entirely with internal variability, but the changes are small. They are physically insignificant, which is just a very nice demonstration of the old saying, statistical significance does not imply physical significance. So I think this is a very nice uh, uh, um, example of uh, this process. <coughs> More attention is going to detection attribution. By the way, uh, the same applies in, in ocean modeling and regional ocean modeling, but the community seems to be unaware of this problem. So you see uh, lots of studies uh, of regional oceanographers uh, where people would claim on the basis of the mean differences and on the basis of the lines, what the effect of this physical, uh, of this experiment would be. Now, more attention than going to the issue of detection attribution. And, uh, two terms, uh, this term uh, is uh, coined by Klaus Hasselmann. And detection means we determine if observed variations are within the limits of variability of a given climate regime. If this regime is undisturbed, this is internal variability of which ENSO, NIO, and so forth are part. So we could, for instance, in particular, we can ask is uh, uh, if we see a change, um, is uh, this in conflict with the, the null hypothesis that it's only due to internal variability? Another application would be if we have uh, climate change simulations and we apply, no, if we are in a, re a regime where climate is changing because of uh, uh, elevated greenhouse gases, and then some geoengineering is applied, then we could ask uh, is a change we are seeing, is it due to the application of the geoengineering or not. Anyway, uh, this type of question is relevant. And if we reject the null hypothesis, then must be an external mix of causes foreign to the considered regime. Attribution, on the other hand, is a case of positive detection, in, in case of positive detection. So if we determine a mix of plausible external forcing mechanisms that best explains whatever that word means, the detected variations. Detection is the application of a statistical test. We reject a null hypothesis. Attribution is not. Attribution is a plausibility argument. Or it is using falsely a non-rejection as an argument for accepting uh, something. And uh, Hussman worked that out in two papers. The first is signal to noise problem in apple straight response studies from 79, very difficult to understand. And then a very clear and easy to read paper of 93, 14 years later, optimal fingerprints for the detection of time-dependent climate change. Now let me demonstrate what this is, and I have a little sketch of that. So just mm -hmm. let's assume that suddenly there's a person lying on the floor. It looks uh, without life, and uh, the servant or whoever is finding her. So first she finds out, is, is she really lifeless? So, or is it so that she's just playing games or whatever, or it's maybe not a real person or whatever. And so we have to check the data of the data, right? But that's not usually not the problem, but sometimes it is. Then you would call the doctor, medical doctor, who would be asked, well, is she really dead? Yes, she's dead. And is it because of broken heart? We consider that is a, a natural cause or has she been poisoned? And so uh, this is the detection part. And then possibly the, detect, uh, the doctor is saying, oh, she was poisoned. So that means there is a crime. There's something to be studied. Otherwise, uh, nobody would be particularly interested. I mean, they would be interested, but uh, it, there would be no follow-up analysis. Then the police comes. So that's a different task. That's the attribution part. And then the police is collecting evidence 
uh, what is uh, who is uh, plausibly uh, the person uh, behind this uh, death? And then uh, the detective possibly would find out and uh, say, oh, it's, it's most probable that it is this lady and maybe she would um, say, yes, I was that. Oh, maybe that doesn't matter. But it could also be that there are two, two uh, who have done it together or separately or whatever. And uh, so this is the fundamental concept here. It's also very easy. I mean, in the end, it is always so, if you have thought long enough about concepts of Klaus Hasselmann, it turns out to be easy. Uh, but before he spelled all this out, it was not easy. And that really makes marks that somebody had significant new ideas. And they are really now common good. Here, this is one of the early uh, diagrams we had on, um, on the detection part. So we have here, something what is called the detection variable that which is actually the projection of the global temperature distribution on a certain pattern suggested by uh, climate change simulations. And uh, here you see uh, um, the solid line is what you get if you examine 20 year trends of this detection variable. And then you need to say what is the what do we assume is the natural variability of the system? And we have three sources to do so. One is uh, the light one is uh, um, a range given by one uh, climate model, the simple one by another one, and uh, the black one is going across the entire interval is if you look at the limited observational evidence but have taken out the presumed a signal due to elevated greenhouse gases. And then what you see is that the system varies between these, uh, in this interval of, of consistency with the hypothesis of only natural variations. It leaves it about 1985 or 90 or so, and the black curve is outside of this interval. That means we have something to explain. We have not necessarily found that it's because of greenhouse gases, but there's something we need to explain. If we do the same thing with a simulation, which starts in 90, whatever, 50 or so, and is until the year 2100, and here we are increasing the greenhouse gas continuously, yeah, then you see that we have the same characteristic behavior. However, it is later that uh, this range of internal, of consistency with the null hypothesis is left. So this could be that uh, the, the model is not fully um, uh, representing the atmospheric state, or is that there's internal variability in between, uh, which is counteracting or something of that sort, we can't say. But <clears throat> we have also simpler ones nowadays. So this is the Borowski approach, which is from 2006. We have, in 2006, we had, of course, uh, uh, much more data. Uh, 10 years or more data. And uh, what uh, they did was they compared, they looked at uh, the temperature, temperature development of the quantity called delta TIML. M is, um, uh, describes that we have M year means, and L is the difference between two uh, uh, M year means. So in the top, we have five year means, which are 20 years apart of each other, and in the bottom, we have 30 year means, which are 100 years. Uh, different from each other, and we used as a, this is the global uh, mean temperature, and we used to compare this with uh, the paleoclimatic reconstructions of a number of authors, uh, such as the famous hockey stick by Mike Mann, but also Moberg, who had a, quite a different um, uh, level of internal variability, or even the uh, skeptic McIntyre, that is 2003, the, uh, that is the uh, well, and we get essentially the same results. Let's just go for the lower one. It all say, uh, oh, the dash curves represent uh, uh, two sigma, um, the, the lowest, and the middle 2.5 sigma, and the top dash of three sigma, is it? Yeah, the uh, vertical axis is sigma. And then we see that in all cases uh, until 1990 or so, for the 30 years, 
centering around 1990, uh, this temperature curve has left the region of consistency with an all hypothesis of no in, uh, external forcing. In some cases, uh, it, it, this happens much earlier. In other cases, it happens a little later, but this is a very straightforward thing. And it, so it shows quite nicely that we have um, an external cause which is behind the observed warming. Sorry, can I <coughs> ask a question about the figure? Yes. Sure. Um, so the gray area is where there is um, only internal variation? No, uh, it is uh, the lowest dash line indicates the area uh, where we assume that uh, where we work with a noise level of two sigma. If we take the middle gray area, we take the noise level as given by 2.5 sigma of the natural variability of the various forces, and the top one is three sigma. So if you're very conservative, then you would say, I take the three sigma. So it's a very strict one. And then you would say everything which is below the top dash curve is the area where you could argue, well, it could be natural variability. Thank you. Now, we, if we go now to more regional things, and to, I have a certain, uh, preference for the Baltic Sea region. So that's a nice seascape and landscape. And uh, we studied here the warming in the Baltic Sea region. And we looked at the 30 years, eight, 1982 to 2011. And here we have four, four seasons, December, January, February, or um, and so forth, but also the annual mean. The temperature change in Kelvin per decade as derived from an analysis of temperature changes given by crew, the Climate Research Unit in Norwich. And then you see we have it everywhere a warming, okay? And then we determined from uh, long simulations where we have no greenhouse gases in, uh, so no external uh, forcing in, uh, how strongly this quantity would vary and this is the red bar and i forgot a little what the small red bar interval is but that's maybe not important but we can see that in case of djf the red bar includes a zero so it could be possible from this paleo simulation that uh, if we have no change we may observe uh, very rarely a warming on average of 0.4 degrees or so per decade. Um, so it, it, it would just be consistent. But this is not so with March, April, May, and not with June, July, August, and not so with September, October, November. So in that case, we would say, nah, we cannot uh, say that the change, the gray bars here, are caused by internal. So there is an external cause uh, to explain the recently observed annual and seasonal warming of the Baltic Sea area, except for winter, when we apply a risk of 2.5%. Good. Now, the next part is to think about um, this attribution thing. So this is also a classical paper. I think originally it, is, it was coming here. And here we have two detection variables. Uh, I will not go into the details here, um, but the ellipses tell us um, where we would expect our climate system to sit if we had, for instance, a CO2 and aerosol forcing. Or if we would, where we would expect that uh, the system would sit if we had CO2 alone or if we had solar alone. And then we insert where the system actually was starting in, and I guess that was something like 1880 or something like that, so I'm quite sure, for 30 years intervals. And we see in the beginning, it varies uh, entirely in the solar uh, bubble, uh, but it could also be natural variability possibly because it's around zero. Yeah, then it moves slowly, slowly to the CO, it, it moves into the CO2 plus aerosol 
uh, ellipse. And so in the end, 1946 to 95, I mean, the study was done at that time. <clears throat> uh, uh, we see that uh, the state of the atmosphere is firmly in the bubble, which would ex need an explanation by both CO2 and aerosol. Or let us say it this way, the only way we can explain it, given these different alternatives, is CO2 plus aerosol. Of course, there could be another reason which we are not aware of, because this is just a plausibility argument and it's not a statistical test. But this is a key argument to show, yes, we can explain the observed change, not by internal variations, that was the detection part, but only if we assume that CO2 and aerosols together play a dominant role. And uh, here I have another case. Um, this is again now for my favorite sea, the Baltic Sea. And um, here we have uh, um, again these gray bars, which you've seen before. But now we have green bars as well. And the green bars have black uh, intervals, black uh, whiskers. And the green thing is what models suggest how the change should look like. These were 10 simulations with the A1B scenario, which is quite consistent. The A1B means refers to the amount of greenhouse gases emitted. And that was quite similar to what actually was taking place. And uh, the whiskers, the black uh, interval, indicates the variations within these uh, 10 simulations from the European project also. And then we see that in DJF, indeed the gray and the green bar are rather similar. And if we take into account the black uh, interval, then the change in DJF as observed is fully consistent with what the model suggests. In March, April, May, this is also so. And then it, we also show that it's not the internal variability. But the situation changes in June, July, August, and September, October, mm -hmm. November. The warming is much more than what uh, the scenarios indicate. And uh, the warming we have seen in June, July, August is warmer than the maximum we have in the 10 ensemble simulations, which indicates that CO2 maybe, which is uh, um, in the uh, scenarios, may be a significant part of the story, but not alone. Uh, by the way, on the right hand side, you see what the models have suggested, suggested on average and what actually came out. But uh, that means there may be another factor, and we presume, but we can't show it, that it is uh, something what happened almost at the same time, namely the take out of aerosols. Aerosol is cooling in a region, and this is particular so when the sun is shining strongly in summer. And uh, if we take out the aerosols, then there's less cooling. And it could be that the difference explained here is because of the success in air, clean air policies in Europe. Uh, the last case I have here is from South America. And the map you see on the right hand side is um, the northern part of South America. So you get, have to get used. On the right hand side, you see Brazil. On the left hand side, you see Peru. And uh, <clears throat> here we are looking at the observed precipitation trends in October to October in the period 83, 1983 to 2012. Um, and uh, if we just do now a local uh, check where externally false changes are detectable, um, and then you see that is the, uh, is the uh, uh, red part. Then you see that for most of the area, we really can see that uh, we have a reduction of precipitation, uh, which is not within the range of natural variations. <coughs> now, what is the cause? And in this case, we have two plausible external forcing mechanisms. And this is the greenhouse gas and the change in land use. And the right hand diagram, the lower right hand diagram shows if we, if these two factors would play no role, then of course we would, we would have a response with zero on both axes. That is the lower left dot. 
if they would be exactly what the model suggests, then we would the upper right double uh, um, uh, dot. But if we look at the ellipse, then we see what would be consistent, which states would be consistent with the simultaneous action of land use change and greenhouse gases. And we see, yes, indeed, it seems that both uh, contribute to the observed changes reduction in reducing CO2. Now the conclusion of all this. Uh, so noise is understood here as internally generated variability, which cannot be traced to external drivers. Short term smoke without fire. And we work with it as stochastic variability, possibly conditioned by some state variables. Keep in mind, it does matter if, if stochasticity exists, but it's a very useful mathematical construct. Of course, one has to understand the mathematics. Really. Now, noise is ubiquitous in the climate system on all scales. And our best explanation for it is due to myriads of nonlinear mechanisms. And it's not relevant if this variability is real stochasticity or, or if it's just impossible to discriminate the variability from stochasticity. As I said, real stochasticity is the most useful mathematical construct. Now, the presence of noise changes the dynamics of the system. The mean circulation would be different if there would be no storms. The storms would be different if there are no convective cells and so forth. And practically, it means noise hinders the identification of externally false signals and the utility of forecasts, of course, as well, and the attribution of anomalies to specific causes. This ends the regular part of my presentation, but I have a little extra here, which I would like to present because I have a little bit of time left over. Namely, I want to talk about significant trends. You read often that an anthropogenic influence is assumed to be in operation when trends are found to be significant. Now, if the null hypothesis is correctly rejected, then the conclusion to be drawn is, if the data collection exercise would be repeated, then we may expect to see again a similar trend. For instance, if we look at temperatures in Amsterdam in month April to July, we would find that this is a significant warming trend as part of the seasonal cycle. And we can say, if we go to next year's April to July, it will happen again, also in a thousand years time. But it does not imply that the trend will continue into the future beyond the time scale of correlation. So for instance, we would not say that September in Amsterdam is warmer than July. So this application of statistical tests of the significance of trends are fundamentally flawed even though commonly used, because most people don't understand what statistical hypothesis testing is. And then I have another case that you may be careful when you look at changes. And this is something important, namely storm surges in Hamburg since 1750 until 2000. And here you see whenever there's a bar, then we had a storm surge, and when there's a yellow thing on top of it, then we had a dike failure, flooding. And so this happened regularly until about 1850. Um, but in 1825, it takes a certain time in Hamburg to build things. Uh, people had heightened the dikes to uh, five meters 70 above normal, which is a number from Amsterdam as far as I know. And then suddenly we had still storm surges, but no severe ones, in particular, no uh, dike failures. And then in 1962, we had a severe one, which was overwhelming the new dike height, 570. Then the dikes were uh, increased to, uh, what is the number now, to 7 meter 20, and later on to 8 meter, and they're still. I mean, increase it now. 
And then you see you have a large number of very high storm surges since then. And you will not be surprised to read that even prominent climate scientists said, oh, see, this is climate change. Everybody knows that storms are getting worse under climate change, and this is proof for that. But now you have to ask yourself, is, that, is the lady really dead, or is it just something else? And here on the right-hand side, you have the same diagram. On the left-hand side, you have an additional diagram, which shows the difference of storm surge heights in Cookshaven, that's at the mouth of the River Elbe, right in the North Sea, um, for each of the storm surges, and in Hamburg. And you see that about until 1960, storm surges in Hamburg were 40 centimeters higher than in Cookshaven. Since 1980, it is more than a meter. And if you're a bit daring, then you would say the change happened in 1962. So this change in the right diagram is essentially showing a real change. And we can also say what it is, namely, it is the improved coastal defense and the channeling of the Tidal River Elbe. It has not obviously something to do with climate change. 